The Lamp from the Warlock's Tomb by John Belairs, Chapter 14. At a little after four in the morning, Emerson's battered helicopter landed in the snowy field near the airport. Miss Eels and Anthony got out, and then she put on her skis and he strapped on the snowshoes once more. Together they trekked across the airport road and slogged into town. There wasn't much chance of catching a cab at this hour of the morning, but Anthony didn't mind the long walk. He was not in a very big hurry to get home. All the way back in the copter, he had been imagining what his mother and father would say to him, and now, as he drew nearer and nearer to home, his stomach tightened with fear. What could he say to excuse himself? As this was running through his mind, Anthony suddenly thought that he heard the sound of a car motor, and as he and Miss Eels turned and looked, a police car came rolling up. The chains on the car's tires chinked, and the red light on top flashed. The car stopped next to two ho next to the two hikers, and a window rolled down. A burly, red-faced policeman stuck his head out, and he eyed the two of them curiously. You wouldn't be Anthony Monday by any chance, would you? The cop asked in a gravelly voice. We'll do his voice again the next time he talks. Yes, I, I am, sir, said Anthony falteringly. Your folks are worried and sick about you. Oh, your folks are worried sick about you, roared the cop. And the whole darn police force is out combing the woods. We've been up all night with dogs and searchlights and God knows what all. Where the heck were you anyway? I... I went on a helicopter ride, said Anthony. Then, quickly, he launched into the story that he and Emerson had cooked up on the ride back. It seemed that Miss Eels' brother, Harlow, had a farm in northern Wisconsin. And he had gotten trapped up there by the snowstorm, so Emerson had decided to fly a rescue mission up to Harlow's place. And on the way, he had stopped in Hoosack to get his sister, Miss Eels. Anthony had helped them load some things on the copter, but he had fallen asleep in the back, and they had flown away, thinking Anthony was back on the ground, making his way home. By the time Anthony was discovered, they were way up north and just couldn't turn back. And that's the truth, officer, said Anthony as he finished his tale. He swallowed hard and stared fixedly at the badge on the policeman's hat. Anthony's mother had told him many times that he got slightly cross-eyed when he lied, and he had always wondered if it was real, if this was really true. Tensely, he waited for the cop to answer. Suddenly, the cop laughed and shook his head. Ha, 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 ha. That has to be one of the dumbest stories I've ever heard, he growled. I don't know if your folks will buy it, but that's not my problem. I'm just going to take you on home. And how about you, Myra? Can I give you a lift? All through Anthony's little speech, Miss Eels had stood there with her arms folded, wondering if Officer Earl Sweat would recognize her. She had known immediately who he was, of course. Officer Sweat had helped Miss Eels many times in the past. So you finally decided to say hello to me, she said, cocking her head to one side and grinning wryly. I was going to pass myself off as Ermintrude von Loon, the famous Olympic cross-country skier, but I see I've lost my chance. That you have, Myra, said Officer Sweat, chuckling. Now get those barrel staves off your feet and climb in. I'd like to get it to bed by dawn if I can possibly manage it. The Seals and Anthony climbed into the patrol car and rode into town. Officer Sweat stopped first at the Monday house to let Anthony off. And, with his snowshoes under his arm, he raced up the snowy walk. When he opened the front door, he was careful not to make a lot of noise. But in the end, it was no use. He had only made it halfway down the front hall when his parents appeared at the top of the stairs in their bathrobes and pajamas. At first, his mother just yelled at him. Then she burst into tears and rushed down to hug him tightly and smother his cheeks with big wet kisses. Later, when everyone had calmed down a little, Anthony told his carefully made-up story about the rescue mission to Harlow Eels' farm. The Mondays had never heard of Harlow Eels. In fact, there was no such person. But they swallowed the tale and seemed to be vaguely impressed by the fact that Anthony had gone on an errand of mercy. So peace was restored in the Monday family. But as he went to bed by the dawn's early light, Anthony wondered what Emerson was going to do about the haunted lamp. A month passed. During that time, Miss Eels had a lot of long-distance phone conversations with her brother, and she passed on to Anthony tantalizing tidbits of information. She told him that the Swiggerts had come back to the farm where they had lived. Apparently, Mrs. Grimshaw had frightened them away, so she had used the place for her own evil purposes. Also, Emerson had located the secret compartment in the lamp. A felt-covered cardboard disc was glued on the base of the lamp, and under this was, was a recessed space like a hollow false bottom of, on a sh of a champagne bottle. And inside this space was a china disc about the size of a quarter that you could unscrew by gripping it with your fingernails. It was there that the mysterious scroll had been hidden. All this news was very interesting to Anthony, to Anthony and it just made him more curious. What were they going to do with the lamp? 
The seals explained that Emerson wanted to put the lamp back in the tomb where it had been, but she added that he would have to wait until the ground in still water had thawed out. Workers could hack their way into the tomb with digging machines, but Emerson was afraid that the vibrations would cause the vault of the tomb chamber to collapse. So they would just have to wait. Early in April, Miss Eels and Anthony took a trip to Stillwater in Emerson's 1938 LaSalle. They had a brief talk with the Swiggerts at their farmhouse, and then everybody went out to the grassy tomb went out to the grassy tomb mound that lay in a field behind the, beyond the house, behind the house. When he got close to the mound, Anthony saw heaps of raw yellow earth piled up on one side of a long round tunnel. It was a tunnel that the robber had used. Emerson had paid some workers to open it up again so that he could put the lamp back where it belonged. Well, here we are. Uh, well, here we are, said Emerson, smiling blandly and turning to his sister. He was dressed in blue jeans and a plaid cotton shirt, which made him look like a rather fussy and unlikely gentleman farmer. He wore heavy work boots and carried a bundle swathed in a piece of old cotton blanket. Well, how about it, Myra? He asked teasingly. Would you like to come in and see the demon's lair? The seals flinched. I'd rather be pinched, I'd rather be pitched headlong down a flight of stairs, she said curtly. If Anthony wants to be morbid and nosy, I have no objection, but I think that seeing the inside of that place would give me nightmares for a year. I'd like to go with you, Mr. Eels, said Anthony eagerly. He was dying to see what the ghastly old place looked like. Emerson glanced quickly at the Swiggerts. They were two stout, frowny middle-aged people, and from the looks on their faces, he quickly guessed that they didn't want to go in. Very well, snapped Emerson briskly as he turned to Anthony. You're a good fellow and a bulwark against the forces of darkness. Now get down on your hands and knees and follow me. With his heart hammering, Anthony scuttled along behind Emerson. The strong smell of earth filled his nostrils, and hanging roots brushed his head. But he struggled on, and at last he reached the weird underground room. When Emerson snapped his flashlight on, Anthony took in the scene. Took in the scene. Stone walls stared with lichen and streaked with with yellow niter, a warped bookcase full of moldy books, a wooden table with a magic pentacle cut into its varnished surface, a brass handbell lying in a corner, a Bible with, a, with limp leather covers, and up against one wall lying spread-armed a grotesque scarecrow with buttons for eyes and a smiling mouth of red yarn. Emerson pulled himself to his feet and played the flashlight's beam around. Lovely place, eh? He muttered. By the way, our scarecrow friend here had a secret sewn into his belly. It's a can containing Mr. Nightwood's ashes. I had to do a little research to find that out, but apparently it's the truth. We have to tidy things up a bit and leave this place the way it was when the chamber was originally sealed years ago. If you, if you help me, it shouldn't take long. For a while, Emerson and Anthony scurried about the grimstone chamber, picking up things and arranging them the way they had been before the robber came. The grimy cobwebbed chair was pulled, that was pulled to the table, and the Bible and the bell were set in the places marked out for them in yellow chalk. Finally, they dragged the rustling limp scarecrow across the room and propped it up on, in the chair. As they set it in place, Anthony noticed that the scarecrow's belly had been ripped open. Probably this had been done by the robber who was looking for treasure. Anthony shuddered. For some reason, this straw dummy seemed almost like a real corpse to him. The button eyes stared blindly. But as the flashlight beam fell across them, they almost seemed to wink. And now you ask what happens, said Emerson, loudly as he picked up the swath bundle off the floor. We complete the charm circle and make our exit. With a flourish, Emerson whipped away the blanket. There was the lamp that had given them all so much trouble. Its base was chipped and there were scorch marks on the sides and the chimney was gone. But it was still a lamp and it could have been, and it could have been filled with kerosene and lit. Carefully, Emerson set the lamp in the middle of the table and then something unexpected happened. In a split second, the room went black and then a greenish halo of light grew out of nowhere and hung over the table. Instead of a scarecrow, Anthony saw the seated figure of Willis Nightwood. He sat with his flabby hands clasped before him on the table, and his beady eyes stared with demonic intensity at the lamp. A blue lightning flash seared the air and the room went dark again. When Emerson's flashlight came on, it showed only a scarecrow seated at the table that held an oil lamp, a Bible, and a bell. Anthony was terrified. He opened and closed his mouth, but no sound came out. When he turned and looked at Emerson, he saw to his utter amazement that the little man was totally unconcerned. He hummed quietly as he waved his flashlight beam around. I expected that something unusual might happen when we put the lamp back, said Emerson calmly. 
such reactions are predicted in this book I read called On the Resurrection of Charmed Cir On the Restoration of Charmed Circles. It's fascinating reading, and I recommend it to you. Now I think we had better get out of here so that Mr. Swigert's hired man can start filling in the tunnel. After you, my dear Alphonse. When Anthony crawled out into daylight again, he saw a tall, gangly man standing nearby with a shovel in his hand. The seals and the Swigerts were there, too, looking anxious, but they cheered up as soon as they saw Emerson and Anthony were all right. Emerson bounced on his feet and brushed dirt off his jeans. So that is that, he said with a confident smile. Keep this place safe from trespassers and human moles, Mr. Swigert, and I'm sure you will not be troubled by any uh, manifestations. Shall we go have something to eat? With the sound of shoveling going on in the background, the little procession wound its way back to the farmhouse. It was nearly noon, and Mrs. Swigert had fixed a huge lunch for her guests, roast beef sandwiches with homemade bread, olives, celery, pickles, and apple pie with ice cream. Emerson had brought along several bottles of expensive champagne to drink with the meal, and he made a big deal out of popping the corks and swirling the bottles around in the elaborately decorated silver ice buckets that were stamped with his own personal monogram. Everyone sat down to eat in the sunny dining room of the old house, and for a long time, the only sounds were, munch were munching and the clinking of silverware and glasses. But after a while, Emerson began to notice that Miss Eels was looking rather glum. She toyed with her sandwich and had taken only one or two sips from her wine glass. So what's with you, Myra? said Emerson suddenly, as he set down his glass and gave his sister a beetle-browed glare. We've survived, and we have defeated a terrible enemy who could have given the world a great deal of trouble. Isn't that enough for you? Miss Eels sighed. I suppose it ought to be, she said, as she tore a small piece of bread off a sandwich and popped it into her mouth. But I can't help feeling sorry for Adele. She really had been living a crummy life, and all she wanted was a chance to be a happier person. I wonder if she really understood the chances she was taking and the powers she was calling up out of the abyss. Emerson sniffed disdainfully. I wouldn't waste any sympathy on her, he snapped. She knew darn well what she was doing, and if she had been given a chance, she would have made our lives absolute hell. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about. He took a big swig of champagne and grabbed a handful of stuffed olives from the dish in the middle of the table. But Mr. Eels, Anthony said, she could have killed us when we came in this house to snoop around. I think she must have let us go because she was friends with Miss Eels. Emerson smiled maliciously. Friends indeed, he said with a sarcastic toss of his head. By the way, Myra, what was it she called you when we were sitting paralyzed on that couch? A flighty flippity gibbet, wasn't it? Miss Eels made a squinchy face. Yes, she said slowly. I do believe that is what it was. She picked up her sandwich, took a large bite, and chewed it. For some reason, it was beginning to taste better. And furthermore, Em, she added, giving her brother a, shrew a shrewd sidelong glance. She called you something, too. Do you remember what it was? Emerson's face got red. He picked a fork up off the table and examined it carefully. No, Myra, he muttered. I don't think I recall. I remember, put in Anthony suddenly. She said you were a rabbity little know-it-all. That was it, was it? Anthony stopped talking when he saw that Emerson was glaring at him. There was a long, awkward silence, which was finally broken by Mrs. Eel, by Miss Eels. Mrs. Swigert, she said loudly and clearly. I'll have a large piece of pie for dessert and two scoops of ice cream. She paused and quickly drained her wine glass. And I think I'll have some more champagne, too. I had a mild fit of indigestion, but it passed, and now I feel like celebrating. And that is the end.